Hello folks and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm talking a little bit more about VCH piercings, this time specifically for my trans men and trans masculine folks. Now, a couple months back, I did do a VCH piercing 101 video. So if you're interested in the basic details about getting or healing a VCH piercing that apply universally to everyone interested in getting this piercing done, go check out that video. This video is just going to go over the information that is specific for trans men and trans masculine folks seeking to get a VCH piercing. And we're gonna start by talking about language. So generally, we call this piercing a VCH or a vertical clitoral hood piercing, sometimes shortened down to just a hood piercing. This is pretty like cut and dry anatomical language, just describing how the piercing is placed and how it sits to the tissue. It's, it's pierced through the clitoral hood, it's pierced vertically, it is a vertical clitoral hood piercing. I find that that language can feel really comfortable for a lot of clients, and if that's the case for you, great. However, this language might not be comfortable for all clients. So the most similar alternative piercing on penile anatomy would be a foreskin piercing because the hood is basically the tissue that would become the foreskin. And when we are talking about piercing a hood for someone who is medically transitioning and has been taking testosterone, that tissue in a lot of instances ends up being more similar to pierce through to foreskin than it does like a cisgender hood. So if you're looking for language that feels a little bit more comfortable or a little bit more gender affirming when you're talking about this piercing, I would refer to it as a foreskin piercing. And if you are seeing like a trans friendly, like trans informed piercer, they're gonna be totally comfortable with you using whatever language feels best for you. In fact, they'll probably check in with you during the consultation process or during the piercing process and say, hey, what language do you want me to use to talk about this part of your body, to talk about this piercing? So if VC or hood feels comfortable, cool, stick with it. If foreskin feels more comfortable, stick with that. I have a really good regular who calls it his hood ornament. <laughs> it is whatever feels the best for you, but there are language alternatives to help you feel a little bit more comfortable discussing this piercing. Now, when we talk about actually getting the piercing, like I just mentioned, the reason why foreskin is such a good language alternative for this is because this tissue really does end up getting more similar to a foreskin than you would expect. When you've been taking testosterone, there's a lot of bottom growth, obviously, and one of the primary areas that changes is the tissue of the hood. It becomes a lot thicker, it grows a lot larger, it becomes a lot more pronounced. For many people, it becomes much drier. There are many, many changes to this anatomy from being on testosterone. Testosterone. As a general guideline, I suggest waiting one year minimum on T before deciding to get any kind of genital piercing, but especially a piercing that's in an area that's more affected by bottom growth. So hoods, triangles, these are going to be our big ones that are going to be our most bottom growth affected. Uh, that time frame is most relevant for folks who are taking full dose T. Folks on low dose T may continue to experience more changes over like a longer, slower period of time. And so you may need to check in with your doctor and see if it's safe for you to get pierced at that one year mark or if you should wait a little bit longer. But generally one year tends to be that safe window. Now the reason why we want to wait a year is because we're worried about migration and rejection. So hood piercings just kind of in general are a little bit more prone to migration and rejection than some other genital piercings in the area. That tissue is just not like the thickest and most stable. And with bottom growth, you're sometimes having a lot of growth very rapidly. So if we do a hood piercing for you, say two or three months into taking testosterone, and you have a major growth spurt after that, that could cause the placement of the piercing to shift, could cause the piercing to become crooked, or potentially the changes from that growth spurt could cause the piercing to begin to migrate and even reject. And we really want to avoid this at all costs. One, migration and rejection leaves a lot of scarring and that scarring can really impede function, sensation, comfort, all sorts of things. But especially if like bottom surgery is in your future, that scar tissue can affect what your options are with bottom surgery. So it's really not worth it to take the risks. Now I know this can be difficult for some folks, especially if this piercing would be really, really gender affirming for you and you're like, I don't wanna to have to wait like a whole year to get this piercing that's gonna help me with my bottom dysphoria. If that's the case, 
you can have a conversation with your piercer, but for me personally, as someone who pierces a lot of trans clients and as someone who has taken testosterone myself and done a ton of research on this subject, I'm going to strongly, strongly encourage you to wait that full first year for safety reasons. I have seen many people get a VCH too soon and deal with pretty serious consequences, including full migration and rejection, where it literally split this client's hood in half. And not only did that cause a lot of scar tissue in the area, they were very upset with the appearance afterwards. It caused a decrease in sensation because just like circumcision, removes the foreskin and you lose sensitivity in a lot of those nerve endings, basically the same thing happened in his situation. It also really impacted down the line what his options were with bottom surgery and it was just not worth it. It was not worth the risk of having just like run to get his VCH pierced uh, a little too soon. So one year is really, that's like the safe waiting period. Now the good news is a lot of the development that comes from testosterone actually makes for a more stable, more durable long-term hood piercing. So testosterone is gonna cause, again, a lot of different changes, but the thing that applies the most is it's gonna increase the size of the hood and the tissue is gonna get thicker and a little bit denser. Um, when I'm piercing through like a non-androgenized hood, it's literally like super thin, usually more like wet tissue. And it literally, it's like, it's more of a membrane. It's a little bit more membranous, just very thin, slightly more fragile tissue when we compare it to the tissue on testosterone. I would say I most commonly use quarter inch through three eighths as far as length goes on non-androgenized hoods. And five sixteenths is like, that's the most common size folks are gonna wear healed. I have clients on testosterone who are getting pierced with half inch, five eighths, three quarters, seven eighths. That's how much their hood has grown and how much thicker that tissue is. Lots of my cisgender clients and clients who have non-androgenized anatomy are interested in stretching hood piercings, but we can only stretch to a 10, maybe an eight max, because there's just not that much tissue to work with. We can only stretch as large as the anatomy will allow. I have one client who has been on testosterone for like over a decade. His hood piercing is like, I think like a two gauge now. <laughs> he wears silicone eyelets in it. This thing is massive, um, still room to stretch further, still super stable, still super durable. Uh, so there's just a lot more options for things you can do with it. And it is, I find a more stable, more durable piercing just because we have more tissue to work with uh, and that tissue is a lot thicker, it's a lot denser, it's a lot more stable. Now the tissue also tends to be drier if you've been taking testosterone. Um, and so that dryness can sometimes cause a decrease in sensitivity and sensation for a lot of clients. And this piercing can be a really great way of returning some of that sensitivity and sensation. It gives new stimulation, new methods of stimulating things, um, and just can be a really nice new sensory experience. So if that's something you've struggled with um, from being on testosterone and you find that that sensitivity has kind of changed a little bit, this piercing could be a really great way of returning some of that sensitivity for you. This piercing could be a really great way of returning some of that sensitivity for you. Now, another thing that I'd like to touch on is jewelry. I find that a lot of my clients come to me and go, are there any jewelry options out there for me besides just like a plain curved barbell with plain beads? When I see pictures of VCH piercings, I always see them with like opals or gemstones on them, which is not necessarily my style. And first of all, let me just say that opals and gemstones have no gender. They can be for everyone. I have male clients of every variety who wear different stones uh, and different decorative elements for their genital piercings across the board. Uh, so stones have no gender. But if you are looking for something that has a little bit more of that masculine feel, of course the classic basic jewelry is gonna be a curved parble with two plain beads, looks really good, really fits. We can do a gemstone that maybe feels more masculine for you on the top. Uh, onyx cabochons are great for here. Tiger's eye cabs are really nice. You could even just do like a hammered metal bead, it's like a bead that has some texture on it. Uh, and I find that that can be really aesthetically pleasing. You can also play with just plain metal shapes. Uh, this style of ring here is called a slave ring. Um, it was popularized for folks in the kink community 
community in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, I'm a little foggy on exactly when we have our like first documented record of this style being used. Uh, but basically, it's a combination barbell and captive bead ring. Uh, and that bead ring can be worn on the top, on the bottom. You can attach things to it. You can have fun with it. You can style it different ways. Uh, very versatile look, very versatile aesthetic. Uh, and that's something that a lot of folks find that they enjoy. If you want to take it a step further and go with more custom jewelry, I have gotten styles similar to this here or this, but for hood piercings that have more of that like industrial metal look and feeling. Uh, and I find that that can be a really gender affirming aesthetic for a lot of folks. You can also stretch the piercing, stretch it up a little bit larger and wear a captive bead ring or a segment ring in it. Uh, like I mentioned, I have that one client who wears eyelets in his. There's lots of different things you can do if your anatomy supports stretching this a little bit bigger. And that can be a little bit more gender affirming as well. You may also consider just a different configuration. This video is intended to talk about specifically VCH piercings, but there is an alternative to VCHs, which we refer to as dukes, which are, which are a pair of offset vertical clitoral hood piercings, one on either side. I obviously cannot post pictures of that here on YouTube. And I've got some really good photo examples of these in my portfolio. There's actually a set of these in conjunction with a triangle on a client who has uh, their hood tattooed. Uh, and if you take a peek, you can actually see scar tissue from their original singular centered VCH piercing. Uh, and you can see that it's no longer centered. It migrated after he started taking testosterone and got his bottom growth, which is why he retired that piercing because it was very off center after that. Uh, so that's also kind of like a good example of why why we wait <laughs> with these uh, for that one year minimum time frame. Uh, but you can see some examples of Duke setups in my portfolio. And I find that these are very visually similar to me to Dido's. And a lot of clients find that this is a much more gender affirming alternative to that singular centered VCH piercing if you have the anatomy that allows for it. Uh, if your hood is too small or it is too tight over the clitoris, it wouldn't be safe for us to do a pair of dukes, so they are very anatomy dependent. Now, when it comes to aftercare for something like this, in general, most folks suggest using saline wound wash. You can use that if it's comfortable for you, but for a lot of us, we're gonna be a little bit drier down there from taking testosterone, and saline can make us even drier. So if you find that saline is really drying you out, you can just switch to rinsing with clean water to clean away any blood, any secretions, any debris from the piercing, and that is totally fine and totally safe. Healing timeframes are going to be a little bit longer if you've been on testosterone. The cool thing about VCHs is, is generally that they're such fast healers. They only take about three to five months to fully heal and they are like zippy zippy healers. But with tea, that tissue is a lot thicker. There's a lot more of it. We got bottom growth. You got a nice little tea dick going on there. That means that it's gonna take longer to heal because we're piercing through more tissue. There's simply more for your body to heal. So depending on the thickness of your hood and your anatomy, you could be looking at more of like a six to nine month healing time frame. Now it's not gonna hurt for that whole time, but that's how long you'll be cleaning and caring for it for. And also how long you'll just be kind of like a little gentler with any activities in that area. So depending on your anatomy, you may expect a more prolonged healing period. But I find even for clients with the most substantial bottom growth and the most thickening of their hood, it still tends to be a relatively easy healing process, just a little bit slower for those folks. Now with bottom growth, that anatomy tends to sit a little bit more protrusively in clothing, and that can make figuring out underwear that's comfortable with a VCH a little bit of a process. Uh, my current favorite recommendation is like the athleisure boxer briefs, where it's that like stretchy athletic fabric. Uh, and kind of a little bit more supportive um, and sits a little bit closer to the body, but it's not like super tight or super constrictive. And I find that athletic material is a little bit thicker. The complaint that I hear from a lot of my clients who wear boxers or briefs is that either it's too loose and the material bunches and rubs on the piercing and feels uncomfortable, or it's too thin and the seam of their pants rubs on the piercing and feels like in a not good way, in a very bad way. Uh, so those slightly thicker, just kind of not compressive, we're not smushing things, we're just kind of holding things in place. Uh, that material boxer and boxer briefs can be really comfortable for a lot of folks. Other folks find just like a thicker cotton boxer feels a little bit more comfortable. Your mileage may vary. You may need to experiment with different underwear styles to see what works for you, but be aware going into this that that is something to keep in mind. 
One last consideration for aftercare is that these piercings can bleed a little bit after they're first done. I usually suggest using some form of menstrual products in your underwear because they're literally designed for absorbing blood, but that can be a little dysphoric and a little bit uncomfortable for a lot of folks. So alternatively, what you can do is get one of those big packs of gauze from the pharmacy uh, or the grocery store and just take a couple pieces of gauze and place them in your underwear. If you're wearing boxer briefs, you literally kind of already have a, a pocket to put those in uh, and a place to tuck them easily, but you can use some gauze to help absorb any bleeding and just change it out each time you're going to the bathroom. Keep like some gauze with you in a bag or with you at work so you have it to swap out. However, if it would not feel dysphoric and uncomfortable for you to wear like a panty liner or a pad, that's a really good idea just because it's literally designed to absorb blood. It's very good at doing its job. You really only have to worry about bleeding for the first couple of days with this one, but it's still something to keep in mind. That way you're not like at the studio or right afterwards and faced with like having to put on a pad or a panty liner and feeling really dysphoric and uncomfortable after a piercing that should have been a really euphoric and affirming experience. So go into this understanding that that might be a part of your aftercare process and just kind of assess for yourself what's gonna feel comfortable for you or not. These are all of my top tips and all of my best information for trans men and trans masculine folks seeking out VCH piercings. And again, if you wanna know more about the basics of VCHs, go ahead and check out that VCH 101 video. I'll link it again here and I'll link it in the comment section down below. Thanks so much for hanging out and I can't wait to chat with you again soon. Bye.